Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. On this channel, we often discuss right to repair, whether or not you're able to fix what it is you own, and whether the manufacturer goes out of their way to cock block you from being able to fix what you own by putting in place digital locks or ensuring that manufacturers do not sell parts, tools, schematics, and diagrams to you. And that has really tied into this whole concept of software and hardware freedom and sovereignty over the past several years. It's really kind of segued the channel from a right to repair stuff to do you actually own what it is you bought and paid for anymore? And many people are starting to realize the answer to that question is no. And one of the questions that's come out of that is should a company have to open source their hardware or their software once a device is end of life or once the company goes bankrupt and is no longer able to support or profit off of their work? I always thought that even getting close to discussing that was just a bridge too far. That was something that I wasn't ready to entertain as a thought until an article that I read today, and I wanted to share it with you and get some of your input. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about here and what it is that is really bringing this conversation up is stuff like this. This is a video I did a few months ago. Arlo cameras take the L with disposable junk. Arlo is a company that sold cameras that cost a little bit more than the competitors, but on the box, it promised you access to cloud storage for free to be able to view alerts. So, you know, again, if somebody walks by your home, you can get an alert, you could look at it on your phone and you could see what's going on. The camera itself is kind of useless without this feature and functionality. And it was something that was offered for free. Like most greedy companies nowadays, they decided to end of life these cameras and then say that you needed to pay for either a new camera or some subscription service to be able to use what it said on the box you would get for free. Now, many people understand that you cannot offer cloud storage and bandwidth for free indefinitely when you have a fixed cost product. If you have a fixed cost product, you cannot offer something that costs money every month to maintain for that product understandable. The problem is that unlike a GeoVision camera, unlike an Axis camera, unlike many other brands of IP camera, this camera does not allow you to change the server that it connects to. At the company that I got hired at last year, we believe that you should be able to have a self-managed or self-hosted instance of any software that we provide. So you can use it running on our servers or you could run your own server. It should be open source. You should be free to use that software the way you see fit, which is different from this approach, which is you connect to our server or F you, which means that anytime the company decides to stop supporting it, it becomes junk. As it says on their forum, given that there is no way to link this Arlo Q camera to any offline storage, I think it's bad policy to leave us with nothing. Even 24 hours would be useful given the promise on the box. And I agree. If you buy a camera, you should be able to choose the server that that goes to. And if they decide to end of life the product, you should be able to get access to something that allows you to use it rather than it becoming a doorstop. Admittedly, I've never gone far into the woods in this concept. The first level of it would be forced open sourcing of hardware or software once that product is end of life and the company no longer supports it. And the next level of it would be forced open sourcing of hardware or software once a company has gone bankrupt. Once a company has gone bankrupt, they cannot profit from it. So it's not like you're taking away any future profits from them by doing this, and they are not going to be able to support it. This article changed it for me. This article in MIT Technology Review talks about a brain implant that changed a woman's life. Then it was removed from her against her will. It says her case highlights why we need to enshrine neurological rights into law. I'd like to read it to you and get your thoughts and feedback on this. Sticking an electrode inside a person's brain can do a lot more than treat a disease. Take the case of Rita Leggett, an Australian woman whose experimental brain implant changed her sense of agency and self. She told researchers that she became one with her device. She was devastated when two years later she was told she had to remove the implant because the company that made it had gone bust. Imagine having seizures for years. Imagine having a problem with seizures that disrupts your ability to drive, go outside, do chores, live your life, enjoy time with your family, and then you get a brain implant that fixes all of this, and then you have to take it out because the company that made it is going bankrupt or has run out of money. The removal of this implant, and others like it, might represent a breach of human rights, ethicists say in a paper published earlier this month. I'll include a link to that down below. The issue will only become more pressing as brain implant market grows in coming years and more people receive devices like Leggett's. There might be some forms of human rights violations that we haven't understood yet, says ethicist Marcelo Ayenka at Technical University of Munich, a co-author of the paper. Being forced to endure removal of the device robbed her of the new person she had become with the technology, Ayanka and his colleagues wrote. The company was responsible for the creation of a new person. As soon as the device was explanted, this person was terminated. What we're talking about here when we're talking about a brain implant that allows somebody to live their life again without having seizures, this is about so much more than a smartphone, 
a smart camera, or a NAS unit that limits your ability to use it once the company goes bankrupt because you don't have access to the source code or the hardware or the software. You don't have a license to continue using it kind of thing. This is your life that we're talking about here. And that's why I'm starting to become a little bit more radicalized into this concept and more aggravated at this whole idea of devices, services, products, hardware, software that are essentially tied to the manufacturer and made useless if the manufacturer goes bankrupt or stops supporting it. Leggett received her device during a clinical trial for a brain implant designed to help people with epilepsy. She was diagnosed with severe chronic epilepsy when she was just three years old and routinely had violent seizures. The unpredictable nature of the episodes meant that she struggled to live a normal life. She couldn't go to the supermarket by herself, and she was barely going out of the house. It was devastating. Leggett was recruited for the clinical trial when she was 49 years old. A research team in Australia was testing the effectiveness of a device designed to warn people with epilepsy of upcoming seizures. Trial volunteers had four electrodes implanted to monitor their brain activity. Recordings were sent to a device that trained an algorithm to recognize patterns preceding a seizure. A handheld device would signal how likely a seizure was to occur in the coming minutes or hours. A red light indicated an imminent seizure, while a blue light meant a seizure was very unlikely, for example. Leggett signed up and had the device implanted in 2010. While trial participants enjoyed varying degrees of success, the device worked brilliantly for Leggett. For the first time in her life, she had agency over her seizures and her life. With the advance warning from the device, she could take a medication that prevented the seizures from occurring. I felt like I could do anything, she said in interviews. I could drive. I could see people. I was more capable of making good decisions. Leggett, herself, now 62, declined an interview. She was recovering from a recent stroke. She also felt that she became a new person as the device merged with her. We had been surgically introduced and bonded instantly, she said. With the help of science and technicians, we became one. Gilbert and Ayanka described the relationship as a symbiotic one, in which two entities benefit from each other. In this case, the woman benefited from the algorithm that helped predict her seizures. The algorithm, in turn, used recordings of the woman's brain activity to become more accurate. But it wasn't to last. In 2013, NeuroVista, the company that made the device, essentially ran out of money. The trial participants were advised to have their implants removed. That company no longer exists. Leggett was devastated. She tried to keep the implant. Leggett and her husband tried to negotiate with the company, says Gilbert. They were asking to remortgage their house. She wanted to buy it. In the end, she was the last person in the trial to have the implant removed, very much against her will. I wish I could have kept it, Leggett told Gilbert. I would have done anything to keep it. Years later, she still cries when she talks about the removal of the device. It's a form of trauma. I have never again felt as safe and secure, nor am I the happy, outgoing, and confident woman I once was. I still get emotional thinking and talking about my device. I'm missing, and it's missing. Leggett has also described a deep sense of grief. They took away that part of me that I could rely on. If a device can become part of a person, then its removal represents a form of modification of the self, says Ianka, the ethics professor. This is, to our knowledge, the first evidence of this phenomena, he says. This removal could be seen as a violation of human rights, Ayanka says. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights incorporates a right to mental integrity, but this can be interpreted in different ways. Most legal systems seem to see it as a right to access mental health care, rather than specific protections against harm, says Ayanka. And the right to freedom of thought enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is similarly open to interpretation. It was historically put in place to protect freedom surrounding beliefs, religion, and speech. But that could change, says Ayanka. Rights are not static entities, he says. He is among the ethicists and legal scholars investigating the importance of neuro rights, the subset of human rights concerned with the protection of the human brain and mind. Some are currently exploring whether neuro rights could be recognized within established human rights or whether we need new laws. A patient should not have to undergo forcible explantation of a device, says Nita Farani, a legal scholar and ethicist at Duke University in North Carolina, who has written a book about neuro rights. If there is evidence that a brain computer interface could become part of the self of the human being, then it seems under no condition besides medical necessity should it be allowed for that BCI to be explanted without the consent of the human user, says Ianka. If that is constitutive of the person, then you're basically removing something constitutive of the person against their will. Ianka likens it to the forced removal of organs, which is forbidden in international law. Now, you know YouTube comments, and I know YouTube comments. There's going to be a loser down there that goes, um, actually, you consented to it at the time of the trial, and since you consented to it on page 846 of the EULA, then there is really nothing wrong here in that. That woman has nothing to complain about. She should live with her seizures and deal with it. Those people exist. They suck. Nobody likes them. They have no friends. They have no family. They have no lives. But they do exist. And the one place that they will creep their disgusting head is in a YouTube comment. Be prepared for them. Ayanka and Gilbert, however, think something needs to change. 
Companies should have insurance that covers the maintenance of devices should volunteers need to keep them beyond the end of a clinical trial, for example, or perhaps states could intervene and provide the necessary funding. Now, what I'm curious about is what the liabilities would be if a company goes bankrupt and goes away if the device stayed in this patient's head. Rather than have some sort of insurance that covers the maintenance of the devices that is going to cost the company a lot of money to carry during the time, what if there was a handshake deal, which is, okay, if you want to go against our guidelines and keep this device in your head and have access to the source code, we are going to be absolved of any and all liability. If this implant blows up inside your brain or turns you into the Loch Ness Monster, or I don't know, turns you into the type of person so horrible that they leave the type of YouTube comments that I was just talking about, we are absolved of liability. You keep this thing in your head, that's fine. You can't sue us. Here's your source code, here's your stuff. Have fun, figure it out, it's not on us. I'm very curious if there's some sort of arrangement that we could come to in cases like this so that you're not forced to take, physically take something out of your head that has essentially become a part of your body. Burkhardt also thinks the industry could do with a set of standards that allow components to be used in multiple devices. Take batteries, for example. It would be easier to replace a battery in one device if the same batteries weren't used by every company in the field, he points out. Ferrani agrees. A potential solution is making devices interoperable so it can be serviced by others over time, she says. Wow. It's almost like proprietary batteries and anti-repair practices suck in every industry, not just consumer electronics. Oh. Imagine having a framework that would allow people other than the manufacturer to maintain the devices they create. I wonder if there's a name for that. I wonder if somebody's been pushing for that for like 10 years now. Hmm. Leggett has expressed an interest in future trials of brain implants, but a recent stroke will probably render her ineligible for other studies. Since the trial ended, she has been trying various combinations of medicines to help her manage her seizures. She still misses her implant. To finally switch off my device was the beginning of a mourning period for me. A loss, a feeling like I'd lost something precious and dear to me that could never be replaced. It was a part of me. And if you actually read the paper on ethics that they were linked to over here, a morning, I mean, I know it's been a while, but I still know what it did and how it worked in a way. If you think about it and you can feel it still, it's like it's still there, but it's not there. You can remember everything about it. And I mean, it taught me. It taught my doctors more about me and more about how to read things. To finally switch off my device was the beginning of a morning period. It's just, it's depressing. And I think that we really do have to solve these problems with smaller devices before these types of devices become more prevalent and more necessary to the functioning of everyday life for a lot of people. It's one thing to complain because a camera that said that I would get cloud storage as long as I had it decided, my bad bro, you don't get that cloud storage. And also, by the way, we are not going to allow you to change the server that your camera connects to after the fact. So if anything happens to us as a company, you are screwed. You bought a doorstop. When we're talking about this, when it comes to HP Inc., when we're talking about this, when it comes to a camera or something like this, like again, it's not as serious an issue, it, but it's the same principle. And if that same principle is going to be a principle that winds up applying to implants in our brain, to things that bring back functionality, there's another person in that article who was paralyzed from the shoulder down, who had regained use of his hands, who had to have the device removed from his head. That's kind of scary. It's one thing to have this whole you will own nothing thing with all the devices we buy nowadays where the devices are made to be disposable or they are made in a way where they need to phone home, they need to talk to the company servers and it's not allowed to talk to yours in order to get things done. It's another thing when you make the product not repairable or maintainable by any third party so that if anything happens to the manufacturer, you're screwed. It's another entirely to apply this to devices that go into your brain. This mentality when applied to a printer when applied to a security camera that you spent $200 on in Best Buy, oh, it sucks, but fine, F it, I'll deal with it. To something that goes in your brain? That's where we have to start having a more serious conversation about this. I know that the idea of a device after being end of life, having its source code made open, may be a little controversial and scary. Let's start it at a much more agreeable point. What about when a company who produces a device that is critical to your health and everyday well-being goes out of business, the source code for that hardware and that software is made available, and in exchange for not being able to sue anybody who works at this company, you can keep that device, you can have the software, the hardware, the documentation, have fun. And again, if something happens to that device, if it blows up inside your brain, if it turns you into the Grinch, if it turns you into the husband from married with children or whatever, that's on you. You can't sue us. In exchange, enjoy, you know, freedom is freedom, live your life keep this thing in your head. I think we really have to figure out solutions to these issues with the small devices, 
before technology evolves to the point where people with the mentality that we have right now are the ones coming up with the rules and regulations for how we regulate something that is put into our brain. I don't want something put in my brain that the company can say, my bad, bro, we messed up our finances. We're taking that out of your brain now and you got to go back to being crippled again. That would absolutely suck ass. And uh, again, but if the thing is, that, here's the thing. If we don't solve this problem now, then we're probably not going to solve it later. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you on the next video. Bye now.